All right, great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Northeast Native Plant Primer, 235 Plants for an Earth-Friendly Garden. Uh, Uli Lormier is here to discuss his new book, the aforementioned Northeast Native Plant Primer, 235 Plants for an Earth-Friendly Garden. A little bit about the book. Uh, you can bring your garden to life and life to your garden. Do you want a garden that makes a real difference? Choose plants native to our Northeast region. The rewards will benefit you, your yard, and the environment. Native plant expert Uli Lormier of the Native Plant Trust makes adding these superstar plants easier than ever before with proven advice that every home gardener can follow. This incomparable source book includes 235 recommended native trees, shrubs, vines, ferns, wildflowers, grasses, uh, sedges and annuals. Uh, it's everything you need to know to create a beautiful and beneficial garden. And this is a must have handbook for gardeners in Massachusetts. Uh, Uli was telling me it was uh, recently number six of all the books uh, in, uh, for the uh, independent bookstores in Massachusetts. So a little bit about uh, Uli. Uh, Uli Lormier is the director of horticulture at Native Plant Trust. He is a tireless advocate for native plants and public gardens, the designed landscape, and those found in the wild. Founded in 1900 as the Society for the Protection of Native Plants, the Native Plant Trust is the nation's oldest plant conservation organization and a recognized leader in native plant conservation, horticulture, and education. The Society's headquarters, Garden in the Woods, is a renowned native plant botanic garden in Framingham, Mass, that attracts visitors from all over the world. From this base, 25 staff and more than 700 volunteers work throughout New England to monitor and protect rare and endangered plants, collect and preserve seeds to ensure biological diversity, detect and control invasive species, conduct research, and offer a range of educational programs. All right, I've spoken for too long, Uli. So uh, all 220 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Uli for joining us here tonight. And Uli, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Robert. And thank you for such an enthusiastic introduction. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen so we can get started. And here we are. So welcome everyone. Thank you so uh, very much for joining me this evening. And, uh, and also big thanks to the um, wonderful network of public libraries here in Massachusetts that are helping to um, sponsor this event as well as uh, allow me to spread the good word about native plants. Um, so I'm going to speak to you a little bit today about uh, about the book and a little bit of the context that brought me to write the book. Um, it's published by Timber Press and it's available now. Um, but a little bit about me. Um, I can credit my green thumb very, very directly to the maternal side of my family uh, with my grandmother on the left here in Germany and my mother uh, on the right hand side and my wife, um, who uh, I met uh, many, 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 many years ago at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden where we were both gardeners. Um, and so I have a lot of fond memories. Um, you know, we moved to the US when I was about five from Germany and I remember uh, spending a lot of time in my grandmother's garden and even assisting her in the evenings on uh, her nightly summer slug hunt where I was handed a pail and a trowel and a flashlight and we walked around and took care of all the slugs that wanted to come and uh, devour our plants. Um, and so I think that her love of gardening certainly transitioned and uh, translated over to my own mother who, who's always had a really great garden and, uh, and uh, I've inherited the green thumb. Um, and so growing up, I was always one of those kids that um, you know, wanted to know the names of plants, wanted to know what was underneath of things. And when we moved to the United States, we moved to Wilmington, Delaware, um, which was very close to a, uh, a very world renowned garden called Longwood Gardens, which is just over the border in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so we spent many, many uh, weekends uh, whenever visitors were in town uh, um, at Longwood Gardens. You can see uh, my younger self here with my sister. Um, and I'd like to think that all that exposure um, had a, uh, an influence on my choice of career and, and career path. Um, we spent a year in Tucson, Arizona uh, in third grade, which uh, was also a very formative year for me, um, where I learned that cacti have spines and prickles. 
uh, and are not fuzzy and are not fun to pet. Um, but I'd like to think that throughout all of those experiences as I became an adult, I never really lost that you know, boyish enthusiasm for the plant world. Uh, and I think that it's still with me today. Um, and during my 14 years as the curator of native uh, flora at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, um, I often walked around with uh, insects and salamanders and bees or with bouquets of sedges um, because I never lost that enthusiasm and certainly not a fear of having insects crawling all over you. Um, and it was a, a useful thing for teaching people the connections between the natural world and all the life that um, the, the plants uh, of our planet support. So um, in putting together this book, um, I really wanted to write it uh, to be inspirational and hopeful. Uh, I think that we're, we're faced with a lot of bad news, and certainly about the environment and about the climate. Um, there's lots of bad news, particularly lately uh, in other realms of our lives. Uh, and so I thought it was really important uh, to, to um, present something that didn't just harp on what we already mostly know, uh, but to try to give people a, a, a positive uh, um, direction and empower them to um, welcome these plants into their gardens and, and to be inspired by them. Uh, and that we really are, um, we're, we're at a point where we do need to think of um, ourselves as part of nature and not apart from nature. And embracing that, I think, allows us to, to create this bridge, as I talk about, that can connect our gardens with all of the wonders of the natural world. Um, the challenges that we face, at least uh, uh, that are, are um, somewhat addressed in the book, um, are uh, exactly what is ecological horticulture? Uh, how does it differ from, from traditional horticulture and why is it important? Um, it's a little bit of a pushback against our, uh, um, I would say the, there's, a, there's a, a, an obsession with things that are neat and tidy. And somewhere along the line, um, we have been convinced that a garden with clipped hedges and straight lines and, and, and a neat garden is one that is orderly and tidy and beautiful. Uh, uh, but that approach, uh, unfortunately, is not particularly, uh, um, it doesn't embrace the, the, the wildlife that could live in your garden if you allowed it to be a little bit more messy. Uh, I talk a little bit about reducing lawns. Um, and you know, again, this seems to be a subject that is, uh, again, gaining, gaining more traction. Um, you know, I have, uh, I'm the father of two, uh, two small boys, and I very much understand the utility of a lawn. Um, but I do think there's ways in which we can welcome diversity in our lawn, we can certainly lose the fertilizer and the pesticide applications, um, and maybe even shrink your lawn a little bit, uh, particularly, you know, if you have children that are uh, adults and don't need to run around and scream and play in the backyard, um, that, uh, that there are ways to, to reduce the lawn surface. But also recognize that change comes slowly. Um, you know, when working with plants, you have to accept that uh, we, we measure success on their timeline, which is seasons and growing seasons in years. And so, um, you know, having done this profession for nearly 22 years now in public gardens, um, I have come to understand and appreciate the utility of, of planning ahead and being patient um, and, and sort of embracing um, delayed gratification rather than instant gratification. And so uh, a lot of the things that I'm suggesting are things that you can try and see how it works for you um, and, and to en enact these changes slowly into your garden and not necessarily, uh, you know, as a with the installation mindset of let's just zero out everything that was there before and move forward. Um, so I think that we are at a point where we need to start thinking of gardens as being not only pretty, but functional as well. And I mean, ecologically functional. You can have both things. And if there isn't a time that is now to do that, then when? Um, I would say that, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, of momentum around an interest in, in using native plants right now. Uh, and so the, you know, the, the message that this book puts forth is very timely. Um, um, we have seen a, 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 a real surge in interest in, in gardening overall. And I would hesitate to say that it is one of the few positives that has come out of a global pandemic. 
Um, but forcing people to stay home uh, and, and saying, well, if I can't travel and I can't go on vacation, maybe I could look at my own backyard. Again, if you're fortunate enough to have a backyard or a front yard um, and to, to realize what a, what a you know, enriching and rewarding space that can be. Um, we have heard a lot about over the years about the losses of biodiversity, the losses of uh, wild areas. Um, again, I, I haven't been back to Wilmington, Delaware in, in many, many years. And the last time I was back, I was, I was immediately struck by the lack of those little woodlots that used to be between you know, the church and the next subdivision and that everything seemed to be built up and built up. And I think that overall, we're continuing to develop um, these quote unquote natural spaces at quite a, quite a staggering pace. And for me, it really emphasizes why uh, design spaces like gardens uh, and commercial spaces are that much more important in, in ensuring that our ecosystem is functional. Um, there's a lot of anxiety around climate change right now. We don't know what the future will bring. We're unsure of, of what the weather patterns will bring, whether it will be wet or dry or hot. Um, and I think all of this kind of combined with, with, uh, with the, the news of, of extinctions and, and declines in insect numbers and bird numbers and, and declines in, in uh, bees and pollinators, all of this kind of amounts to folks wanting to do something positive, something to support our wildlife. Um, and so I think these are all some of the factors that are really driving this surge in interest in gardening. And you can look at that in a couple of different ways. Um, but before I do that, uh, I want to just sort of uh, jump on a little bit of a soapbox, a slight tangent, if you'd like, um, that involves the idea of biodiversity. And I want to propose a slightly different way to think about it. Um, and I, uh, this, this beautiful scene here um, was uh, taken in Kennebunk, and I know that uh, uh, we have somebody who's joined us from Kennebunk right now. This is the Kennebunk Sand Plains, a very special place. Um, and um, if I were to, you know, put on my botanist hat, um, I could uh, go into this grassland and generate a long list of all the different kinds of things there and say, well, this is a good way to measure how biodiverse this grassland is. There are, let's say, you know, a hundred different species of plants in here. Uh, I could call my um, entomologist friends and say, let's survey all of the insects and bees and beetles and butterflies and all the other sorts of things. And we could come up with a number for that. Um, maybe there's some fungi in here. Um, but the point is, is that um, each and every one of those different things as we measure biodiversity is weighted equally, no matter if there's only one of them or if there are 10,000 of them. And this is exactly the point that bioproportionality seeks to address. Um, we oftentimes use biodiversity as, uh, as justification and saying, well, you know, here's a, here's a nice flat land that we could build some houses on, but it has a hundred different species on it. But we've got a hundred species over on this other piece of property over here, and so, uh, it's okay because there's still biodiversity over there, even if we plan to make changes to this particular landscape. And the idea of bioproportionality really seeks to uh, uh, ask the question, how many of one thing do you really need in order there for, their, uh, for that one thing to be able to survive and reproduce and pass on you know, uh, uh, um, um, adaptations that are beneficial uh, and allow it to adapt to an uncertain future. Um, and so that I think is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a theoretical question. There isn't a, a number that you can say, well, you need a minimum of 10,000 of this plant in order for it to be secure or 100,000. But um, I do think that we oftentimes in, the, in, in, our, in our measure of biodiversity um, think that, uh, that as long as there's at least one or a handful or something that it's weighted just as equally as something that is overly abundant or even a, a, a non-native or invasive species, which um, some folks will argue have actually increased the biodiversity of New England. Um, at this point, we probably count roughly a third of all of the plants that you can find in New England as non-native to the region. Um, so that's quite a number. And we've had a long history of introducing plants um, ever since the first Europeans stepped off the boat here. 
Um, so just some food for thought again, and I think that uh, how, how that translates to, to design spaces and to gardens is that these are places where you can make decisions about what kinds of plants to plant and how many of them. And if you decide to plant some native plants and your neighbors do, and maybe the folks the next town over, collectively, you're inching more and closer towards that overall proportion of plants that are really needed in order for them to survive and stay on the landscape. So again, some, some food for thought. Unfortunately, this did not make it into the book as it was uh, a very new paper um, that was just published in 2021. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's intriguing enough as a, as a thought uh, to include into this talk. So just to think about that a little bit. Um, so other ways that you can measure the interest in native plants currently, we can take a look at public spaces. Um, and you can take a look at all these different uh, aspects in which um, uh, uh, the use of native plants is desired. Uh, so state DOTs, not just here in Massachusetts, but in Maine and other, and other New England states are looking at ways to transition mode roadsides and right of ways into pollinator habitat, uh, all of course that requires native plants. Pollinator pathways as more of a grassroots effort, um, sometimes on a, a local or municipal scale or township scale. Uh, and these are uh, really wonderful groups of folks that are trying to, to create connectivity between natural spaces uh, and, in, and in between neighborhoods um, so that pollinators have enough resources to travel back and forth and, and thrive and, and survive. Um, one of my staff members was uh, successfully involved in a municipal ordinance in the city of Somerville, um, which has now legislated the use of native plants in public spaces. Um, and so we're really proud of that effort. It was maybe about three or four years of, of lobbying and works and meetings with the city and back and forth in order for them to adopt this. But it shows that it is possible. Um, we routinely get uh, questions and requests from solar farms. Um, do you have a low growing native pollinator mix that we can use instead of mowing around those? Schools and universities, we've partnered, at least Native Plant Trust has partnered with uh, Smith College um, to uh, um, produce native plant seeds on campus uh, and engage their student body in, in direct plant conservation work and action. Nearly every botanic garden that I could think of has some native plant display or is including more native plants into their displays. National and state parks, certainly also jumping on, uh, on this, this trend um, where you know, visitor centers are being landscaped with regionally appropriate native plants. Even shopping centers and corporate parks are, are beginning to show signs of this. Um, there's a, a shopping center here in Sudbury that features uh, native grasses and shrubs and some perennials. Um, and I see that as all really positive and showing that you can design commercial spaces um, that are appropriate and that fit into the surrounding landscapes. Uh, in the private space, in the private sphere, um, we're increasingly seeing more homeowners that are looking to transition their turf uh, and lawns or, or uh, uh, non-native exotic plantings. Um, this article that's cited here from the Washington Post um, chronicles the, the uh, challenges that a particular couple faced in uh, um, Virginia in wanting to turn their front yard into a pollinator meadow and um, the uh, threatening letters and legal action that they faced from the homeowner association um, because they, they claimed that um, their lawn didn't fit in with everybody else's property. Um, so these are real uh, challenges that people feel when you kind of step out of the box a little bit um, and it requires a degree of courage to do that. Um, there's a whole new generation of, uh, of, of um, landscape architects and designers now who are really emphasizing ecology as well as aesthetics and the use of regionally appropriate native plants. And I can say that our own uh, um, public programming and education at uh, Native Plant Trust over the last few years has seen uh, an absolute explosion in interest. Our registration for our courses, uh, I think was up nearly 50% over last year. Um, so people are beginning to pick up the message. I would have been astounded 10 years ago to see uh, native plants gracing the front covers of major nationally syndicated periodicals like Fine Gardening and Horticulture Magazine. Yet here they are, which kind of is another reason that, that or another way for me that uh, says that, you know, native plants have arrived in a way. 
Um, even Forbes magazine, the place, the last place that you think you would find articles about native plants, um, uh, is, has a, a wonderful little article here about a nursery owner in Tennessee who has transitioned away from um, their normal offerings to only offering native plants and was just blown away by the, the support that the community shows. She's getting involved in restoration efforts with the state. Um, and, uh, and, and really has recognized this as, as a, a positive direction to go. Um, and so much so that, yes, Forbes magazine is talking about native plants as well. So um, another way to look at that is to look at how native plant sales have grown. Um, more and more nurseries, uh, garden centers are stocking native plants because uh, customers are demanding them. Uh, here in Massachusetts, we have a couple of brand new native plant nurseries are relatively new. Uh, Blue Stem Natives down in Norwell is relatively known, and they're doing fantastic work. Helia Native Plant Nursery is uh, out in um, the Berkshires. Um, and at Nasami Farm and Garden of the Woods, where we also sell plants, um, last year we've seen a 30% increase in sales alone. Um, and the last four years have seen a pretty remarkable 15, 20% growth annually in our plant sales. So um, people are really demanding this material. Um, and so I think these are really, it's, it's a good and positive uh, um, development. So in thinking about how to, uh, how to inspire uh, more gardeners to use native plants, um, I thought about what different ways in which I can help in, in aside from the, the um, recommendations of, of the specific plants themselves in the, in the introductory chapters, what are the sorts of things that I can impart that might help inspire people? So uh, first, um, we talk a lot about how to define a native plant. Um, and to some degree, this definition is subjective. You could certainly make an argument that um, any plant that grows in North America is native to the continent. Um, is a Colorado blue spruce native to America? Yes, uh, maybe not so to Massachusetts, um, but it'll grow here. Uh, but maybe it doesn't have all of the relationships that it evolved with out in Colorado. Another way to look at how plants are distributed uh, has less to do with, uh, from the plant's perspective, really arbitrary political boundaries that we have imposed on the, on the landscape. And has much more to do with this concept that you see here uh, on your screen now, which are called ecoregions. And ecoregions kind of, uh, um, they're united by similarities in, in geology and soil and land use and land cover and, and plant community type. Um, and hydrology to some extent into these broader, uh, broader zones, if you'd like, or regions. And so in Massachusetts, we have three different regions. We've got uh, the Northern Highlands region in the Western part of the state that shares some similarities, excuse me, with uh, uh, Vermont and New Hampshire, with the Adirondacks, with the Catskills that you can see as another little green uh, um, or teal blob. Uh, in New York State and certainly down into uh, the Poconos and the Ridge Valleys of, of New Jersey. Um, and then the dark blue, which is the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens. So again, if you're familiar with the state here, southern New Jersey has a beautiful pine barrens. The eastern Long Island has pine barrens dominated by pines and oaks, just in the same way that the Cape and the islands have a particular look to them in the plants uh, that are there. And so, um, if you really want it to be regionally appropriate, you would try to source your plants from within each of these eco regions. And I recognize that's a challenge. Many nurseries don't know where their plants come from to begin with. Um, so I'm content at this stage to, to introduce the idea to folks and say, hey, look, this is a different way of looking at landscapes that has more to do with the plants and less to do with whether they identify as being members of Massachusetts or Connecticut or Rhode Island. Um, bringing a little bit of a, a little lesson in from, uh, from ecology, uh, I talk about plant succession. And so plant succession is this process by which uh, um, open space, so maybe a, a former agricultural field, um, transitions to a forest. It might take 200 years, but it's a relatively well understood and relatively orderly process with um, plants, the first ones that move in to these sort of situations are ones that are shade intolerant and they've evolved to be aggressive. 
They've evolved to spread via rhizomes, to make prodigious amounts of seed, um, and to cover ground. And they will then provide uh, the shade for smaller trees and earlier so what we call pioneer trees like eastern red cedar or gray birch to move in. They create more shade and then slowly over time the plant community transitions over to more shade tolerant and eventually you know mature canopy sized trees. So what do you learn from this? Well um, in the book I use the example of goldenrods. We have a lot of wonderful goldenrods in New England um, the kinds that you find in old agricultural fields are very ill suited for small gardens. Um, they're the kind of plants that some people might even label as invasive native plants, um, but it's not their fault. They evolved to cover space. And so if you know that about them, then you won't choose uh, Canada goldenrod, for example, for a smaller garden. Um, Canada goldenrod is an outstanding plant, has lots of uh, wildlife value, but it needs room to, to move and, and, to, and to, to spread on its own. So it's not suited for that. There are other goldenrods that behave much more nicely. They form a clump, they seed in very slowly. Um, they may be more shade tolerant and dry shade tolerant, which I know are other tough conditions that uh, many gardeners um, face. So um, learning a little bit about plant succession, and I tried to include this as much as I could into the plant descriptions themselves, um, was important. Um, really throughout the book, um, I, there's, a, there's a very common thread that is wo woven through uh, a lot of the text, and that is that these plants are home for lots of life. Um, and so welcoming life into your garden is as easy as having uh, three-dimensional space, so having tree cover, having a shrub layer, um, and uh, a ground cover layer. Uh, and so I would argue, why have mulch when you can have plants that cover the ground? And letting the leaves lay where they fall in the spring is great, uh, in the fall rather, is great because that leaf litter is home for queen bumblebees, uh, um, caterpillars uh, that will turn into butterflies, uh, a whole host of organisms that uh, are either blown away or raked up and bagged up when we're uh, um, too quick to tidy things. And it doesn't mean that you have to leave your leaves everywhere, but um, consider having leaves as mulch in your, in your garden beds. It's free. You don't even have to pay for it. You just have to rake it and spread it yourself. Um, so really the point here is that um, we have to move a little bit beyond gardens as purely being things that are aesthetic and pretty to look at. Um, and really embrace the idea that they have to be ecologically functioning as well. And this is where you have, um, you begin to kind of grapple with this wonderful long, long running, I mean, we're talking millions of years here, uh, long running relationships that plants have with insects, and particularly with pollinators. And while non-native plants will certainly support some insect life, they're not completely devoid of it, no other plants will come nearly close to supporting as much insect life as native species do. Many of our pollinators and the things that eat, uh, uh, eat our uh, plants, uh, so caterpillars and other things, for example, uh, have what amount to dietary restrictions. So they can only survive if they have the right kind of pollen or the right kind of leaf to eat. And so it's really important that we begin designing and using plants with their benefit in mind, as well as uh, enjoying the plants' intrinsic beauties in their own. So from the pollinator's perspective, um, maintaining uh, a, a good uh, pollinator diversity is really uh, uh, um, reliant upon species diversities of plants. In other words, the more different kinds of plants that you have, the more plant-pollinator interactions there can be, and that increases the availability for these plant-based foods and shelters and nests and all the different stages in, uh, in trophic levels in, in life. So our little chipmunk friend here uh, really needs the fact that uh, the seeds that he eats uh, are pollinated by the insects that come from the plants that surround him. And just in the same way that the red-tailed hawk here who I captured disemboweling a squirrel um, really needs all the things that make sure there's enough squirrels around for, uh, for her to be able to, uh, to survive. So all of these things are really connected. That's kind of the point here. So 
Um, many, well, let me back up and say that um, supporting pollinators is, is a really popular, easy way in which to, uh, 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 to, to get into using native plants. Um, when we look at our bee population here in the Northeast, um, nearly a quarter of all bees, and so there's, there's about 400 some species of bees in the Northeast of the United States, which is pretty astounding, of which the honeybee is one of those, okay? Um, and many of them are small, many of them are solitary nesting, and many of them, about a quarter of them are specialists. In other words, they're the ones with the dietary restrictions. They have this specific plant that they need in order to fulfill their nutritional uh, uh, their, their own nutritional needs so they can reproduce and survive. Um, they are solitary nesting, which means that they're uh, active, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for shorter periods and tend to be much more sensitive to things like climate change and shifts in um, uh, blooming patterns and timing of blooms. So supporting these uh, is really incredibly crucial. And these plants will also support all your generalist pollinators as well. So you're really getting uh, uh, you know, a, a twofer here when it comes to pollinator support. So um, I'm gonna show you a number of different plants here. Not all of them are profiled in the book because I had to stop at 235. If it was up to me, it would have been 500 plants. But, um, but in the aster family here, we have a lot of choices of things that are great for not only specialists, but for generalists as well. So things like flea banes, asters, uh, tick seeds, um, black-eyed Susans, sunflowers, blazing stars, even thistles, sneezeweeds, ironweeds, more asters. We've got lots of wonderful asters in the state here. And did I mention goldenrods? Yes, we have lots of goldenrods. Um, many of these are great garden-worthy species. Um, things like Joe Pye weeds down in the bottom uh, are all really wonderful. Um, because of their ability to support such a wide array of wildlife. Uh, bone sets, ground soles. Um, if you need some structure um, in the heath family, we've got a number of really wonderful shrubs, um, all of your deciduous azaleas. Many of them are also incredibly fragrant. Um, evergreens like uh, really great rose bay, uh, rhododendron, um, mountain laurels, um, huckleberries, winter berries, uh, who doesn't like picking their own blueberries from their own garden uh, and cranberries as well. And even the state flower of Massachusetts, our trailing arbutus, falls into this category. Um, so these are all really wonderful plants, uh, not only for the, the gift of fruit that they provide for us, um, but because they, because they support such a great amount of, of life. Um, spotted horse mints, for shade lovers, you've got uh, um, bishop's wort and foam flower. And violets, I really love violets. They come in lots of different colors. They're very unobtrusive. Um, they fill in in all the little places that are sometimes hard to grow in between other plants. And if they're ever too exuberant, they're very easy to edit out. So violets are fantastic. Here are some nectar plants that have, uh, for, for bees that have short tongues. Again, so you're looking at, uh, at uh, a lot of the milkweeds. Um, nectar plants for long tongued, uh, uh, insects, so things that have long tubular shape uh, or long nectar spurs, um, all really wonderful plants. And one of my favorites from the book here is, is a little montage to show that um, pollinators aren't just all pretty bees and butterflies and moths. Um, they also include uh, some pretty nasty looking flies, a cicada killer, even a daddy long leg I found on this one. Uh, particular clematis vine, all, uh, all drawn to this plant because of the copious amounts of resources that it has. And afterwards, it produces these wonderful fluffy seed heads, which I then later on learned that uh, goldfinches use to line their nests. So a really wonderful uh, a circle of life here with, uh, with all of these pollinators and these plants. Lawn care, lawn care is big business, $105 billion a year. The USDA estimates half of the average household water use goes to water lawns. Um, there also uh, are absolutely drenched in fertilizers that are unnecessary and pesticides that are unnecessary. And so there's lots of good suggestions in the book here for ways to uh, encourage and welcome diversity into your lawn. So how about those violets, for example? Um, you can let them flower in the spring and then you can mow over them. It's totally fine. 
Um, your lawn does not have to look like a putting green. Um, so consider reducing your lawn. One of the other things that I think distinguishes this book is that I only recommend species instead of cultivars of natives. Um, and the reason being is that I think that um, no matter how many pretty plants or improvements that humans have sought to create, which are what cultivars are, they're cultivated varieties of native plants where humans have had a hand in breeding them and selecting for them for different characters. Um, nobody can improve on mother nature's design in terms of the evolutionary relationships with insects. They also have a great deal more genetic diversity than many of the cultivars do. So if you can find them, um, please consider adding and embracing and, and welcoming some of those into your gardens. I also recognize that um, most of what you can find out in the nursery is our cultivars, which is also fine. It's okay to do that too. Um, the book has lists in it, which I really love. I love lists. Um, they're great to, to kind of look down and say, oh, I'm looking for drought tolerant plants or evergreen natives or uh, sh uh, shrubs that might spread or sucker if I need to compete with some invasives that I've just removed. Um, I also have a, 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 a list of host plants for caterpillars and moths. And this is important because native plants produce a, and, and host a lot of different caterpillar and moth uh, species. Um, and 96% uh, of our songbirds need caterpillars in order to successfully raise a brood of chicks in the springtime. And so where are they going to get all of those caterpillars? There was a, a, a really delightful study done that showed that a, a pair of Carolina chickadees, in order to raise a brood of five chicks, needs somewhere between seven to 9,000 caterpillars to do that. And that's a lot of caterpillars. It's a lot of trips back and forth to the nest. Um, and so um, you really have to have plants that are going to support that volume of insects. And again, native plants are your answer. In the uh, uh, plant profiles, we have these wonderful little icons that we worked on including that uh, indicate whether or not the plant is used by birds for food, shelter, to seed dispersal, nesting, uh, whether they support native pollinators, they support butterflies, whether it's a larval host for a butterfly or moth species. And then the frog is to say, hey, you know what, there's other mammals and amphibians and reptiles that also make use of these plants. Uh, so don't forget about supporting us as well. So a sample for you here are two uh, uh, choke, choke berries, red choke berry and black choke berry have all of the icons. They're real wonderful uh, four season plants with beautiful flowers in the springtime, uh, um, you know, nice, nice foliage in the summer, berries in the fall and good fall color and good structure and, and you know, red, red uh, uh, leaf buds and those sorts of nice little details for the winter landscape. Um, and I really tried in all of the, of the individual plant descriptions to highlight some uh, ecological value that the plant has, um, which is again, a theme that has, has really woven through most of it here. Um, in the section on vines, we talk about how you can use vines to screen uh, unsightly views, um, hiding things like you know, uh, garbage bins and compost bins and so forth. Uh, and that um, all these vines are a real uh, boon for resources and local wildlife. And that, you know, if you wait long enough, you might even find a nest or two hidden in the tangle. Um, the largest group profile by far is the wildflowers um, because they are diverse. They grow in a lot of different light conditions, soil types, different kinds of habitats. Um, and I really encourage folks to make that connection and go out and try to see some of these plants in the wild and see how they grow, with whom they grow, and all that information just by observing them um, can really be beneficial for you as a home gardener. I also included annuals. You know, uh, many folks were surprised to, to learn that we actually do have a number of real true annuals uh, in, in our flora. Um, many of the things that we consider annuals like petunias and marigolds and begonias and sort of bedding plants are actually perennials in tropical climates. Um, they just aren't cold hardy up here. But we have a lot of wonderful ones and they can be introduced as seed or as plants. Um, they will most certainly flower the very first year because they only get one year to do it. And then the hope is that they seed themselves around and maybe they fill in a little gap in between plantings or they pop up in 
a nice place. And if they're if there's too much or if it's not in the right place, they're very easy to edit out as well. So annuals are really fantastic. Um, I want to leave you with a few thoughts here uh, about um, about the the use of native plants is really being something uh, that's very forward looking. Um, I managed to get a picture of my first son in the book here. Um, and I really think about this a lot when I look at this picture because he's going to inherit the earth after we're done with it. Um, and whatever I can do to make sure that it is uh, as wild and as beautiful uh, as, it, as, as I found it to be when I was a child, uh, I'm gonna do everything in my power to do that. And to end uh, the, the talk, I'm gonna leave you with, with just a, a, a quick reading of two passages that I think are, are amongst my favorites in the book, which is, which is to say that you know, using native plants is not an effort or an attempt to recreate conditions of the past. It's a very forward thinking act. And it's an act of compassion because we're really looking to help the remaining flora and fauna survive in a very uncertain and fast changing world. For those folks that say using only natives or only species is limiting or elitist, um, I would say it doesn't hold up unless you're only gardening for yourself. And that recognizing that the, the situation that the world is in now requires a, a degree of courage and, to face those challenges and ask yourself about what's really most important. What do I value most? Is it a clean and tidy lawn or is it one that supports wildlife and is part of a larger ecosystem? And when viewed through that lens of value, you can see that using natives, it isn't a shackle, it's actually uh, an act of liberation. And it shows that you place value and the ability for future generations to take advantage of the same benefits and privileges of biodiversity that we and our ancestors have enjoyed. So with that, I would say thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Uli, wonderful job as expected. Uh, yeah, let's take uh, 15 minutes of questions from the audience. Folks, if you have a question, uh, please type it into the Q&A. Uh, I will monitor the chat box, but please uh, type your, try to type your question into the Q&A box. Uh, first question comes from an anonymous attendee, uh, and I'll pretty much bottom line it for you. Um, she asks, uh, what do you do if the native species for your area just aren't attractive? Well, so I would say that the, the, the reason people find mop heads attractive is because um, most of those flowers are sterile and they just hang on the plant for a long, long period of time. And it gives the impression of actually being in bloom for much longer than, uh, than it actually is. Um, and the, the native one that, uh, that you're talking about here um, actually produces uh, um, fertile flowers to which the insects are attracted. Um, I would say there are a number of different cultivars and selections of um, um, uh, smooth hydrangea, hydrangea arborescence, or hydrangea radiata are two other good ones for the Southeast um, that you might consider. Um, there's one that I grew at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden that's called Total Eclipse uh, is the name of the cultivar. Um, and it was fantastic and absolutely covered in bees when it was in flower. And I thought just as attractive as any of the mop heads. So maybe, uh, uh, maybe you just need to find that happy middle ground in accepting and looking out or seeking out rather um, a, a, an attractive cultivar of a native as opposed to uh, the mop heads, which were really bred just to have lots and lots of sterile flowers that, that really provide nothing for your local landscape. Uh, Susan asks, which plant identification app do you recommend? Well, um, I'm on the fence about these, um, to be truthful. Um, I, I, I don't use one. Um, um, mostly because I'm also of an era that remembers pre-cell phone days um, and, and uh, uh, making you know, pay phone calls and all that. And so I learned my plants with an actual field guide and following keys. And I think the advantage of that is that you, you, get, to, uh, you get to learn the plant in a much more uh, intimate way rather than pointing your phone at it and taking a picture and saying, oh, tell me what this is. Um, I do think there are some good sort of community-based uh, uh, resources out there. And the one that I would recommend is iNaturalist. 
And so uh, iNaturalist is really fantastic. And there's a, there's a lot of people that post images to iNaturalist that, uh, um, that are sort of collectively or crowd ID'd. Uh, and it helps uh, researchers, uh, particularly if you're out in the woods, um, to know where plants are at any one given moment of time. Um, there are a few other ones that, that some folks uh, uh, um, have suggested, but I, I, I'm going to stick with those two, um, iNaturalist and um, the old fashioned field guide. I think there's no better way to learn plants than, than to actually look at them uh, and look at them carefully and not just through a picture. All right, a, a different Susan asks, uh, can the native plants stand up against some of the invasives that are everywhere in a garden? Um, some can and some cannot. Um, and again, I think that, that the, the, the trouble with invasive plants is that they don't have the same kind of checks and balances in terms of things that eat them. Um, they tend to be more tolerant of, of disturbance. So um, that can come in the form of, uh, you know, mowing, gardening is an active disturbance, um, or, you know, maybe uh, uh, from when your house was built and they mowed down or cut down a forest and brought in other things and stuff has been established in that way. Um, I think that the, the, the most successful way uh, without using pesticides is to try to remove the invasives and to immediately follow up by planting native plants that uh, can spread and can, uh, uh, can compete. Um, and so again, you're, you're gonna have to make some decisions about, about you know, do you really want something that's going to spread and compete in your garden? Because um, if all you're looking for are plants that are going to make a clump and stay put, they're likely not going to be able to, uh, to survive against the more rampant invasives that are out there. Uh, a nice comment from Elena who says, I bought the ebook version of your new book as soon as I learned you'd be speaking to us. I think I'm going to buy the hard copy version as well. Thank you. I have some digging up and rearranging to do. Thank you. So uh, Uli, let's uh, let's try to um, go quickly through some of these. We have a lot of folks in the chat asking, is such and such a plant a native plant or not? So uh, we'll kind of okay. do a lightning round here. I don't I don't sure. expect you to go through all 235, but um, <laughs> Jeanette is wondering, are daisies a native plant? Uh, so the oxide daisy that people see everywhere, the classic daisy with the yellow center, is not a native. It was introduced with the Europeans a long time ago. And similarly, the orange daylily that you see everywhere is also not a native. It's native to Europe and Asia. Great. And the, the daylily question was from uh, Karen, I believe. Uh, let me see here. I thought there were a bunch more. Um, Diane asks, are sunflowers considered native to our area? Um, some are, but if you're thinking about, you know, the really large, large ones that you might see in a farm field, um, those tend to be uh, cultivated ones from somewhere else. But we have um, maybe six or seven species of sunflower. Uh, there are a couple that will actually grow in dry shade as well, which are really wonderful. Um, but they tend to have slightly smaller blooms and not the really larger ones that people think of uh, when they think of sunflowers. Uh, Maria and Dennis ask, are elderberries native to the northern New England states? Absolutely. And they're delicious and they're all in flower right now. So um, definitely, you know, if you, if, you, if you know of a good spot, um, keep your eye on it and try to get those berries before the birds do. An anonymous attendee asks, uh, are native plants dangerous to domesticated pets? Um, so uh, we do have a couple of lilies, for example. And I do know lily pollen is toxic to pets. Um, uh, for the most part, no, uh, unless your pet is like actively eating the plants or eating the flowers. Uh, but there are a few that, that um, again, they're, um, if you consult the uh, um, you know, SBCA websites and so forth for poisonous plants um, uh, in regards to pets, they can tell you what to avoid. Uh, not, all, no, not across the board. Yep. 
sorry, Uli. Uh, Loring asks, do you have any recommendations for how to introduce the idea of native plants in a condominium setting with a well-established traditional landscaping approach? Well, um, I would suggest um, starting off small if you can. Uh, so rather than proposing a, you know, a full scale, uh, um, you know, redo of the whole landscape. Uh, and I would also try to find, again, you'll probably have more success looking for cultivars of natives that um, are, for better word, sort of short and tidy. All right. Because uh, I think those sorts of things are going to go over better uh, in introducing people into the idea of natives than necessarily, um, you know, a, a, a wildflower meadow or something like that. Um, you know, in terms of selling points, again, you know, the 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 condominium uh, landscape doesn't exist in a bubble, um, and uh, it has just as much uh, opportunity to support local wildlife as. Uh, you know, a residential home uh, uh, or even, a, 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 you know, a local park does. Uh, and so the importance part is that everybody tries to do a little bit um, to support that. And by supporting and by putting these plants in, you might see more bees, more pollinators. Um, if you choose things that are host plants for butterflies, for example, um, that's a good way to draw it in. And also to say that because of the amount of insects that they support, you're also going to draw more bird life to the condo. Um, and while I don't really, I can't begrudge the wren that wakes me up at five in the morning uh, at my house, I'm glad that he's here. And he's here because there's lots of native plants. Uh, so I'm going to combine two questions. Uh, Kate asks, should we consider the impact of climate change uh, climate change when choosing our plants, and if so, how? And a related question from Amy, who writes, given what you were saying about the uncertainty of climate change, um, is there uh, what looks like uh, shifts uh, in native species? You know, will today's native species continue to thrive in our areas? And have these plants areas of growth been enduring and truly native over time? So, um... That's a it's a it's a pretty big topic, so I'll try to I'll try to you know um, summarize or or um, abridge my comments a little bit. Um, so I think that um, we don't necessarily need to start thinking of sourcing plants from the south now to get ahead of what we think Massachusetts will look like in twenty years or from fifty years from now. Um, I think that climate change is not only about things moving north and south and about, about warmer winters and hotter summers. It also uh, involves shifts in precipitation patterns. And so scientists who track this are seeing shifts in plant species uh, moving east and west in response to things getting wetter and drier, just as much as we're seeing slowly things moving north or things that uh, you know, for example, a plant that 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 only lives on the top of uh, uh, Mount Greylock right now, uh, when things get too hot, it has nowhere else to go. So it'll get squeezed off the top of the mountain, although it may still exist further north in Vermont or uh, in New Hampshire. Um, so that is 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 uh, is part of the complexity of the question. I think the real answer lies in making sure that we have enough genetic diversity in our local plant life as possible, because that's going to be the key to allowing it to adapt to uh, to whatever the future holds for us. Um, if it, you know how long has our flora been in place here is really a question of time and context. You know, if you go back long enough, most of New England was underneath of an ice sheet. So there really wasn't anything here 15,000 years ago. Um, and then as the glacier receded, um, you know, what came in would have looked like northern Canada now. And then that moved north as well. And things from the south moved in. But we're talking about a time frame of 10,000 years or longer for these plant communities to migrate. Um, what I think makes this question particularly intriguing and even more complex now is that we as humans have introduced plants from not only other parts of the world, but also from other parts of the country into New England. And so 
Uh, perhaps another question or another food for thought is how long do we have to wait for the plant from the southeast that you planted that's now escaped into the local woods and established there? How long do we have to wait until that becomes a member of our flora? And I think the real reason you, you know, to really kind of drill down to it even further is to say that any kind of definition of, of a flora has to be considered as, as fluid uh, and, and always changing depending on the time frame within which you're considering it. So Uli, um, let's take uh, five more questions. I want to sure. acknowledge we've hit eight o'clock. Uli's answered about 10 audience questions. There's about 30 to go, but we're only going to take five more. Uh, I will do my best here. Um, Uli, thank you for being generous with your time. Of course. Uh, so Krista asks, uh, we just moved from Colorado into our new house in Wilmington, Massachusetts last week and have started ripping up the back lawn to put in a decent sized edible pollinator native garden. What plants would you recommend for easy propagation that won't break the bank? And do mm -hmm. you know of any local groups that, would, that you would recommend for plant swaps and plant purchases? Well, so um, I would look into uh, um, seeing if there are local uh, pollinator pathway groups, because um, they're oftentimes hosting plant sales uh, and so forth. Um, Garden clubs are also great sources for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, people to share plants. Um, and um, uh, garden clubs need more members um, and they need more people to, to get involved in that and to carry that really long and uh, important history of, um, of, a, of a gardening community forward. So I think they're really great, uh, um, great folks to get involved with. Um, I would say that if you have space to, um, to, to cover, um, consider plants that are going to, uh, going to get a spread. You know, I don't, I don't know what your yard looks like, so I can't uh, recommend specific things, but things that will spread on their own will help you uh, in the long run, uh, rather than things that you have to wait and divide and then spread around that way. Um, it's hard to say. What, here, here, what, what I can do um, uh, as a, as a follow-up in the chat, I'm going to put my um, email address in, and then if folks have other questions that obviously folks do and we haven't gotten a chance to answer, um, I'm happy to try to field some of those via email if you have specific questions about um, recommendations and so forth. Um, so um, that's probably the best way um, for our, our uh, you know, recent transplants from Colorado uh, for me to give some more specific information. And that way I might be able to field a few more questions here. That's great, Uli, uh, great thinking. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, um, is there some place or some business in my area, the Lowell, Massachusetts area, that might have these native plants? I guess, uh, do you have a recommendation as to where people uh, in Mass uh, should buy their uh, native plants? Well, there are not too many nurseries. I think that uh, um, as far as uh, nurseries that only carry native plants, there is Garden in the Woods in, in Framingham, uh, the couple others that I mentioned, uh, um, Blue Stem down in Norwell. Um, but I think a lot of local, uh, local um, garden centers will carry some uh, natives here. Uh, I see in the chat, somebody put in the Monarch Gardener, if switch sells only natives. So there are definitely other ones out there. Um, but this actually brings up uh, a, uh, um, a, a, another good point. Uh, also Van Berkham Nursery, which they, they may be only wholesale, but, um, but uh, if you do shop for plants, and particularly for native plants at garden centers, a um, couple of important questions to ask before you give them your, your credit card or cash. One, was this plant produced with any pesticides? This is incredibly important because I think that it's, a, it's perhaps one of the cruelest ironies that people seek out native plants because they wanna support insects and pollinators uh, and then don't realize that the plants have been treated with neonicotinides or other pesticides that are poisoning the very organisms that you are trying to, uh, um, trying to support. So, um, and, the, that, and this, is, this, is, this is difficult to do and I recognize this. Um, if they can't give you a good answer, don't buy anything there. 
I know it's really hard to go to the nursery and confront with all these beautiful plants and thinking of the possibilities for your own garden to walk away empty, empty handed takes a lot of willpower. Um, but I think it's important that the nursery industry also begins to understand that people want plants that weren't grown with pesticides. And then secondly, if they can tell you anything about where the plant is from, uh, that would also be really great. Um, but that is a little bit harder. And I see here in, in, the, in the chat, there's lots of other great suggestions of nurseries um, that, uh, that carry some native plants as well. So there's definitely good stuff out there. Um, so uh, with that, let me just say uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have any other further questions, please don't hesitate to um, send me an email. Uh, I will do my best to answer um, in a timely fashion. Um, and thank you for all your support uh, with the book. And thank you, Robert, for the opportunity to um, present about my work. Yeah, no, thank you, Uli. A wonderful job. Uh, folks, look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, a link to this recording. Uh, I'll include uh, Uli's email address. Uh, there'll be a link to purchase a copy of Uli's book, and there'll be some information about some other virtual gardening programs that are happening uh, this summer. I want to thank uh, Wellesley Books for being our bookstore partner. I want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library and the Corning Foundation for sponsoring tonight's event. I want to thank the uh, 17 other libraries, who I will thank uh, in the email tomorrow, uh, for partnering with Tewksbury tonight. And most importantly, I want to thank Uli uh, for giving a wonderful presentation and for all of you uh, for watching. So thank you all so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Thanks again, Uli. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Okay. There we go. Great. Bye-bye.